You are our Redeemer. You've given us your Son to show us how to live, to show us how to love one another. You've given him to uh, die for us, to be Savior of the world, and then to be raised again to new life. So uh, enter into our lives with that new life, with that great news that you love us that much, with our sins forgiven, uh, set free to be your servants. So as we hear your word today, may it uh, dwell in our hearts, may it dwell in our minds, and may it be kind of put into action as we live out that gracious identity that you give us as people of God. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, there's an old story. Uh, Maybe you've heard it. It's when uh, Jesus had finished his mission on earth, and he had ascended into heaven, And he was there together with the angels up in heaven. The angels were saying, nice job, Jesus, way to go. You completed your mission. You lived on earth. You taught. You preached. You healed the sick. You did all kinds of ministry. And then you went to the cross and you died for all people as Savior of the world. And then God raised you up to new life. And now you ascended into heaven. You're here. Nice job, Jesus, way to go. And they started high-fiving Jesus saying, way to go. You completed your mission. So in honor of Jesus completing his mission, turn to your neighbor and give him a high five and say, thank you, Jesus, for completing your mission. Go ahead. It's awesome. Jesus completed his mission. But then the angels asked that all-important question. They said, Jesus, now what? Now what? What's your plan for getting that good news of the gospel out to all the people down there on earth? And Jesus said, well, I left my followers to do that. Guys like Peter and James and John and Matthew and women like Mary and Martha and Priscilla, I left that to my followers. They're going to do it. They're going to keep it going. And the angels kind of looked at each other in disbelief, and they uh, started cracking up, laughing, thinking that Jesus was joking. Ha, good one, Jesus. LOL, Jesus. Peter, you mean Peter, the one who stuck his foot in in his mouth all of the time, who denied you? And Mary and Martha, who were kind of uh, ticked off at you when their brother Lazarus died, and they were bickering back and forth way too much. You left them to do your work? And Matthew, are you kidding me? He was a tax collector. He was hated by a lot of people. You left Matthew to do your work on earth? Come on, Jesus, what's your plan? And Jesus replied, no, I'm serious. I'm serious. That's my plan. I've given them my Holy Spirit. I've given them my authority. I've given them my presence. I trust them. Even the people at Gloria Day Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, they are far from perfect. They're broken vessels in many ways. But you know what? They're awesome. They're going to take this ministry seriously. They're going to take this ministry joyfully, and they're going to get it done. They're going to be my ministers in their part of the world. I think I'm going to ask Gail in the office to start printing in our bulletin the pastor's names. We'll say Tim and Chris and Sarah and Dwight and Bob, but then we'll put ministers, the whole congregation, because we are all ministers. Jesus has given us all the task of being his ministers in his name. And in our gospel text, as I said, Jesus sends out not just his 12 disciples. He gathers 72 of 70, 72 of his followers to go and do the ministry that up until this point in the story, only Jesus has been doing. But now as he sets his face towards Jerusalem and he goes, he knows he's on the way to the cross. He's equipping his followers to do the same work that he has done. And so he sends them out. And the number 70 or 72, as it is in some translations, has significance. Because if you go back into the Old Testament, for example, in Genesis 10, in and around the the Noah story, the Noah experience, after God is repopulating the earth after the great flood, God names 70 people. In naming those 70, he says there are now going to be 70 nations. And then you get into Numbers chapter 11, and the same thing. There are 72, or there are 70 nations, and then they add two because they say that there are going to be more nations in the world. Jesus is saying, as he gathers his 70 or 72, that these people are to go not just to Sioux Falls, not just to our country, but around the world. He says they are to, you are to go and make disciples of all nations. And so that number has significance. Jesus is, in essence, saying to you and me today, it is time for us to take this mission to the streets. Let's go out to the streets. Now you go. You are being sent. 
You do know that when we come to worship, it's important for us to be fed. It's important for us to be fed spiritually by God's word, by the sacrament, by the fellowship of believers. But this Christian faith of ours is not just for us to be fed. It's not just for us to have a consumer mentality, to be consumers of the Christian faith and to kind of think, well... I didn't, you know, whether or not I liked the sermon today or not, or whether I liked the music today or not, or whether or not I liked the Bible study this week or not, that's not the right mentality. I want you to like all those things. It's important to like all of that, but Jesus makes it abundantly clear that we are called not just to be receivers of God's grace, consumers of Christianity, but we are called to share it, to be givers of God's grace as well, God's grace to us and then God's grace through us. So you and I are sent. We are mission-minded people. The Latin word for mission literally means sent, the sent ones. So you and I are sent ones in Jesus' name. Have you ever been sent? Can you think of a time when you've been sent? It's not always easy being sent in Jesus' name. I remember once when I was was trying to remember, it was either the third grade or the fourth grade, We had a man who lived down the street from us on Carter Avenue in San Jose, California. His name was Bob Button, Mr. Bob Button. Isn't that a great name? Well, my friends and I in the third grade, uh, we kind of dared each other once that when we saw Mr. Button out in the front yard, we'd go up to him and we'd tease him and we'd say something like, how's your belly, Button? Get it? We thought we were so clever. How's your belly, Button? And no, none of us, of course, ever dared to tease him in that way. Until one day, I was walking to our elementary school, Leeds Elementary School. It was just about a half a block from our house, and Bob, Mr. and Mrs. Bob Button lived uh, on that route. And I was walking past the Button's house, and there was Mr. Button out in his front yard. And I don't know what came over me. Something came over me. And I looked at him, and I yelled, How's your belly, Button? And I smiled like he'd think it was funny. He didn't think it was funny. Uh, <laughs> In fact, he looked kind of hurt. And so, of course, as a third grader or fourth grader, I ran and I ran. And I don't know how this happens, but my parents got wind of that. Uh, Parents have a way of hearing things. I still, to this day, don't know how exactly they heard. But when I got home, they said, "Uh, Tim, uh, my mom made a plate of brownies. And she said, you're going to go down to uh, Mr. and Mrs. Button's house tomorrow. And you're going to take this plate of brownies, and you're going to make amends. You're going to apologize. You see, Mr. Button and his wife, Mrs. Button, were members of our church. My dad happened to be the pastor. And uh, the pastor of the church did not appreciate his son making fun or teasing someone uh, because of his name. So the next day, I kind of complained when they said, no, we're serious about this. And I'm like, really? Are you kidding me? I don't want to go down to see Mr. Button after what I did, what I said. But at nine years old, I was being sent to do the hard work, the hard work of asking for forgiveness. Sometimes Jesus sends us into some difficult, difficult situations. And uh, my parents were having none of my excuses, so I took the plate of brownies, and I walked slowly. I remember walking very slowly down the street, plate of brownies in my hand, praying. I don't know if I've ever prayed so hard, praying that Mr. and Mrs. Button would not be home when I got there. But of course they were, no such luck. And of course it happened to be Mr. Button who answered the door. He invited me in. I sat there in their living room. I gave them the plate of brownies. I told them that I was sorry for making fun of their name, teasing him, how's your belly button? But that's a kind of a cool name, isn't it, Mr. Bob Button? I like that name to this day. But we had a great talk, and before I left, no joke, they asked me if I wanted to mow their lawn on a weekly basis and earn some, um, some extra spending money. And I was really wanting to earn some extra spending money. So uh, I said yes, and that was the start of a really good, great relationship that I had with Mr. and Mrs. Bob Button. And when I came back home after that visit, my parents asked, well, Tim, how did it go? I said, awesome, they're really nice people. And they uh, invited me to kind of mow their lawn. They hired me to do that. Thanks, Mom and Dad, for the opportunity. And Mom, they loved your brownies, by the way. And I went down to my room. 
And I think God had a hand in all of that. You know why? Because I think God was teaching me at a very young age that sometimes we are sent into some difficult situations. Sometimes having to apologize and to ask for forgiveness, that's never very easy. Sometimes having to grant forgiveness, that's never very easy either. Sometimes he sends us to feed the hungry. Sometimes he sends us to welcome the stranger. Sometimes, like in our text, he sends us even to heal the sick, to cast out demons. God sends you and me all of the time, every single day. Watch for opportunities. God sends us. And when God sends you, here's a little advice from your pastor. It's best that you simply drop what you're doing and just go. What's that old Nike slogan? Just do it. When God sends you, it's best not to resist, not to complain, not to say, I can't do it. Just simply pray about it and go. And I know that God will equip you. He's there with you. He gives you his authority, Jesus does, and he equips you with his presence. So he's with you even if you falter. Just do it. I remember on internship, I did my internship in the country of Brazil when I was at the seminary, and early on in that year, one of our parishioners uh, in the rural town of Cuiabá in the state of Mato Grosso, Brazil, one of our parishioners was killed in a farming tractor accident, and my supervisor, Alberto Basque was his name, he said to me, Tim, I want you to go see his wife and their little kids, and I had all kinds of excuses. I can't. Uh, uh, I don't speak Portuguese very well yet. They may not even understand me. I'm only the intern. You're the real pastor. Why, why me? Why don't you go? But he sent me into that situation as a learning experience. So I went over to that widow's small dwelling in that rural setting. I was nervous. I didn't quite know what to say. And I read scripture in broken Portuguese. And I participated a few days later in that man's funeral. And I came to have an important relationship with that woman and her family over that time period. Friends, the important thing about being sent, and you and I are always being sent by God into situations to be the voice, to be the hands, to be the feet of Christ. The important thing is simply to pray about it and then to go, to go, to act, to do, to just do it. You have Jesus' presence and you have Jesus' authority. The longtime pastor of Saddleback Church in Southern California once said this. He said, a church is measured not by its seating capacity, but by its sending capacity. I like that. A church is measured not so much by its seating capacity, but by its sending capacity. This church has great seating capacity. Sometimes I wish it were even more. But you know what we're more proud of in this place is that we have great sending capacity. I know youth and young adults who serve regularly in this congregation through Feed My Starving Children. That is sending capacity. Most of you are bringing, many of you are bringing pasta and soup and serving at the mobile food pantry uh, early uh, in February. Take a look at your bulletin. There's details about that. That's sending capacity. This congregation is collecting supplies needed for 10 people heading uh, next month to Nicaragua to make a difference in Christ's name. We're sending them, but Jesus is sending them. That's sending capacity. When you give of your time, when you give of your, uh, your, your talents and your, your passions, when you give of your hard-earned money to God's work at Gloria Day and in other organizations, that's sending capacity. I know people at this church who mentor kids at local schools, tutoring for free, spending time as a big brother or a big sister. I know confirmation mentors, church school teachers, lawn mowers here at church, quilters, food preparers, servers, worship participants, Bible study participants. I know people here who serve on boards of many organizations across this city and across this state that are worthy organizations making a difference. I know one of you who babysits your neighbor's kids after school, until their parents can get home from work. And the list goes on and on and on and on. You are an amazing people sent by God to do God's work in this world. And why do you do these things? Why do you take the time to go the extra mile? Because in one way or another, you know that Jesus has commissioned you. 
that Jesus himself has sent you. He sent you into the world in his name. He's given you gifts. He's given you abilities to serve. He sent 72, and they rejoiced, those 72, those 70, when they came back to Jesus. They were rejoicing. And do you remember what Jesus said when they came back and they were rejoicing? He said, I saw Satan fall from the sky. What does Jesus mean by that? He means that every time you and I go out and we follow Jesus and we are sent into the world to make a difference, we are defeating the power of evil. We are seeing Satan literally fall off of his perch and God's reign is coming into being. It's as we sing sometimes, and we sang this last week, if you were here, with every act of love, we bring the kingdom come. The devil is being defeated. He was defeated once and for all on the cross, but by every act of love, he is being defeated over and over again. God's reign, the kingdom of God, is here. This past week, we witnessed the inauguration of a new president, and his term lasts for four years. But Jesus inaugurates you. He commissions you. And your term lasts not just four years. Your term lasts a lifetime. You are inaugurated, commissioned. We saw Hudson being commissioned today, grabbed hold of as a child of God. Your term lasts a lifetime being sent out into the world by Christ. And the good news is it not only lasts a lifetime, it lasts for eternity. Jesus says to us, I'm going to take this world and I'm going to turn this upside down world right side up again. And he says, guess who's going to help me? You are, and you are, and you are. We all are. I said it two weeks ago and I'll say it again today. People of Gloria Day, you keep the faith. You continue to keep the faith, but don't you dare keep it to yourself because the faith is not meant to be just consumed. It is meant to be shared. You are sent. I am sent. That is good news. We are loved, called, and sent by Christ to be the neighbor, to be Christ for the neighbor, and to take it out to the streets. So thank you for the way in which you do that so well at Gloria Day as we continue to go deep in faith and wider in outreach. Amen. And may the peace of God, that peace which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.